pregnant with hatred for hell. We need to hate what we're firing at or we're not going to defeat the spirit of pornography in America. We're not going to come against the spirit of suicide and the spirit of homosexuality and these, these debauchery demons that are going throughout our school system. There comes a moment in your life where you got to hate what you're firing at. Welcome to the Buford Church of God. We are so excited that you are joining with us today. This audience that is viewing us through the television is part of our family. We take this as an honor and a privilege to serve you today. And we're asking God that the same anointing we feel in the sanctuary will be communicated through your television right there into your home. We believe that where two or three are gathered together, either in person or through this means of communication, that we are gathered together in His name and He is there among us. And we're asking God to meet those needs in your life today. We're going to pray a special prayer for you today. We're going to ask God to bless you and guard you and allow this service to minister to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. God, I ask you to touch every viewer today. Be with them. Go meet them right there where they are. I pray you'd restore them, heal them, bring them to the knowledge of you, God, and bless them and let your glory be revealed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy the service. Thank you, Jesus. Let it be God. I don't know who in this church is wrestling with the confusion of Leviathan or the manipulations of the sexual deviance of Jezebel, but mark my word, find your identity in the Word of God, not in the pronouns of our culture. Find your identity in the Word of God and not in what they say and what the tele television tries to tempt you to be. God created you. And you'll only find happiness when you pursue what his purpose is for your life. Thank you, Jesus. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. There's a spirit of Korah, which is the spirit of rebellion. The spirit of rebellion is basically the words of Korah. Who are these leaders? I'm as spiritual as they are. I can preach. I can find it. I don't need any influence. I can find it on my own. I was listening to Jeremiah Johnson which is a really cool name. I don't know his ministry well enough to, to speak intelligently about everything that he's doing, but I like this quote that he had. So please forgive me as I read this to you. One of the absolute strangest things that I have observed in church circles over the years is people who launched themselves into ministry who were never even serving in their local church consistently. Sir, how is it God is now calling you to plant a church when you have literally sat in church for years and never served or sacrificed? The giving records show you never tithed, and the attendance record shows your commitment was sporadic, but now suddenly you're a pastor or apostle with a calling from God? Ma'am, how have you now launched an international women's ministry when you were known to operate in the Jezebel spirit at your own church for years? You sowed division and gossip locally, but now God has anointed you for the nations. Young people with a calling to ministry, how has God now called you into a new season when you were never faithful to your pastor in the old season? You never served him while he answered the calling, and now you're mad because he won't bless you and yours. <laughs> to those who faithfully served in the local church, submitted to church leadership, and then stepped out, when it was your time, I applaud you. Your patience and endurance to a process will give you longevity in ministry. To those who launched yourself into ministry without having prior history of sacrifice and service to another church or ministry, you're headed for a rude awakening. Maybe the issue is not controlling leadership, but a root of rebellion and pride in your own heart. You don't need to get jealous of the people who sing in the choir or teach a Sunday school class or preach a sermon or lead a department. Jealousy will lead to a rebellious spirit. And that rebellious spirit will take control of you and ultimately you'll pay a price you wish to God you never had to pay. Well, I think I'm smarter than they are. We know them. You are smarter than they are. Believe me. <laughs> you know, I think I can sing the song better than she can. Pastor Bob's like, mm, probably so. <laughs> But we don't promote people based on talent and skill alone. 
We promote people based on the authority of God and his church. Your position in the body of Christ is not bequeathed to you because you're better than other people. It's bequeathed to you because a holy God chose you for that moment to serve others. Resist that spirit and it will flee from you. There's the spirit of Cain, which is rebellion in action. When you're no longer satisfied with just rebelling, now you want to take their life. You want to hurt them. You want to wound them. You want to destroy them publicly. Talk about them behind their back. You're so jealous that they can do something that you feel like you should be doing that you're willing to tear down their house just because you want to live in it. What you don't realize is you end up destroying them and you. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I'll repay. There's nobody on the planet, listen to me, that stands between you and acceptance with God and promotion in his kingdom. They can't hold back God's plan. You're dealing with God. And you need to submit to him until he opens the doors. Am I right about it? And ultimately, the spirit of the Pharisee is all of the six spirits in previous cooperating in one person's life where they've made a religion out of their rebellion. They occupy the church, and in the words of Christ, woe to you Pharisees, because now you evangelize the whole world, and once you win them, you turn them into twice the son of hell that you are. And there are churches that have become so overcome with a rebellious spirit, a Pharisee spirit, that the church itself becomes an enemy of the kingdom. But I've given us some good advice over the last few weeks of how to defeat these spirits. And I want to remind you of them that I'm going to add one final and we're going to get out of here today and enjoy our Sunday. Not that you're not enjoying it right now. I just don't think it was as fun over the last few minutes as it has been over the, <laughs> over the day. Number one, never complain about what you're willing to tolerate. If you're willing to let him live in your house, he'll park it right there until the day you check out. Number two, we are not a fortress. We are an invasionary force. It's not our job to hold the fort. It's our job to knock the gates off of his fort. It's our job to invade the devil's territory and occupy the houses that he built and take Goliath's own sword and use it as a weapon against the hell that's tried to destroy our lives. Number three, keep the fight outside your soul. The armor protects your thoughts, feelings, integrity, and habits. If you start having the anxious feeling of worrying about what other people are thinking or doing, it's because oftentimes you've made personal what actually is a battle that belongs to the Lord. Number four, don't fight a battle for which there are no spoils. Sometimes you're wound up over nothing, and even if you win, who cares? Men, we've learned this lesson. We really only have one objective, and that is the romance and affection of this beautiful lady that God has put in our lives. And sometimes it just ain't worth it. If she says you said it, we don't get to be the keeper of history. <laughs> Let it go. If there are no spoils in it, why are you fighting? Ask yourself, if I win this, if everybody believes me tomorrow, what are you going to get out of it? Number five, wait for the sound of marching in the mulberry trees, meaning wait for the presence of God to go before you. Sometimes you're fighting the right battle. You're just early. Be patient and let God lead you. That's what Moses did. Moses started fighting the Egyptians before God anointed him to set his people free. And he had to be vanquished to a wilderness for 40 years because he got ahead of God. Make sure you use the weapons of God, the armor of God, the family of God, the gifts of God, the word of God, and the name of God. Number seven, close the gate when you're strong enough to close it. Don't wait till you get home to do something with this sermon. Do it right now. Come down to this altar and leave your devils down here. Don't go back home and say, I'm going to think about it. Because once you start thinking, you start stinking. (laughs) 
Stinking thinking. That's a good sermon. I think my dad preached that years ago. Did you steal that or did you come up with that? You stole it. <laughs> we grizzles are good at borrowing. Stinking thinking. All right. Number eight, don't be afraid because fear is the smell of worship in hell. We don't have to be intimidated even though the devil is trying to intimidate us. Number nine, if you can name it, you can defeat it. If you can call the devil by name that's come against you, there is a superpower in knowing and having the knowledge of the enemy that's come against your life. Why? The Bible says that he has given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow every tongue confess it can't be above until you name it that name is above a name your problem is you don't know what your problem is but if you can ever get to the place going you know what I bind that spirit of confusion right now in the name of Jesus I don't know why I'm so wound up and being manipulated by that spirit of Jezebel I come against that spirit of Absalom that's trying to make me mad at everybody who has a position that I covet I come against that spirit of Cain I don't want to hurt them I put the keyboard away I turn the computer off there's no reason for me to gossip I bind it in the name of Jesus resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Number 10, worship God and only God. The devil had come against Christ, wanted to destroy his life. And he said, no, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and only him shall you worship. When you start to praise God, the devil looks for an exit. When you start to glorify and magnify his name, the devil has to flee from you. He may come in one, but he gotta, he's got to leave seven different ways. Second Chronicles chapter 20, I want to read this to you. It's a long reading, so please indulge me for a moment, but it's a great story. And I want to teach you this one final spiritual attack against the enemy. Second Chronicles chapter 20, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? And the prophet was sent to Jehoshaphat. And he said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours but God. Tomorrow, what does God give you when he wants to bless your life? He gives you a tomorrow. You see, before you were blessed, you lived in yesterday. But after you're blessed, you can live in what God's going to do, not in what the devil did. Tomorrow, go down against them. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Get in the right spot. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Buford Church of God. Do not fear or be dismayed. You go out against him, for God is with you. And the pastor bowed himself with his face to the ground, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites... All the worshipers, the children of the worshipers, they rose up and started to shout with voices loud and high. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So they rose early in the morning and they went down to the wilderness and as they went out Jehoshaphat stood up and he said hear me O Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem believe in the Lord your God. And when he had consulted with the people he appointed those who should go out before the army singing and shouting for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And when they started to sing the Holy Ghost went to the enemy's camp and caused the enemy to fight one against the other. You know how you beat Jezebel? Leviathan takes her out. You know how you defeat Leviathan? Absalom's going to take him out. Because in the Shekinah glory of God, the devil gets confused. 
When God's praise goes up, his glory comes down, and the devil just starts swinging. I told you this story. Pastor Rod Parsley had a, had a parade, a LGBTQ plus pride parade going through the town in Ohio. And he said, we're going to go down there. You're not going to protest. You're not going to say anything. Please protect your children. It's going to be perversion on display. But I want you to line both sides of that street, and I just want you to start praising the Lord. And that parade started coming down the center of that city street. And his church lifted their hands and started glorifying and magnifying God. And a little deaf boy, his parents brought him. He dropped down to his knees and started screaming. My ears! My ears! And that boy could hear. He was healed. Pastor Rod Parsley questioned the Lord, what happened? And he felt that God spoke into his heart and said, when you started to praise me, those spirits in the glory of that worship moment got confused as to who they were fighting. And a principality resting on that parade slew that little deaf spirit that was on that boy. When you start working in the supernatural victory that God has assigned to the church, you're going to have power that you know not of. If you'll engage the enemy, there's more victory on the other side of this combat than I have time to tell you about today. But I want to teach you how to do what Jehoshaphat did. So, Pastor Todd, if you'll come on up here. The Bible says that when they were going down there, they got their swords. They were ready for battle. They were going to do two things that day. They were going to pray in terms of combat, the spiritual warfare. That's prayer. That's my combat. And they were going to praise. Now, I've told you over the past few weeks there were two battle cries that the Hebrews would use. When they would lift up the Ark of the Covenant and they would put that Ark of the Covenant on their shoulder, they would cry out, Arise! Arise! Arise, O God, and let your enemies be scattered. Arise! Arise! Arise, O God, and let your enemies be scattered. And then the Levites would start to worship. For the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. Now, I want to do two things in this sanctuary right now. I want you, if you've got a spirit of discernment on you, if you know how to bind the power of help, Dad, come on up here. You're, you're the best ghostbuster I know. He studies this kind of thing. He has a spirit of discernment on him. As a matter of fact, God's going to use him in the altars today. I'm going to go preach to Oakwood. As soon as I'm finished here, I'm going to go to our other campus. And my dad is going to lay his hands on everybody that comes to this altar like he did last week. God's going to use him. But I want you to lead one part of this army today. I want you to call out those spirits. Name them. Bind that spirit of infirmity. And if you feel like that's your calling today, I want you to hate what you're firing at. And I want you to start to bind those, uh, those demons, those spirits that have attacked your home, your church, your community, your state, your nation. I'm going to fight against it in the name of Jesus. No more am I going to allow this spirit of Jezebel loose in my life. No more are we going to allow this spirit of Leviathan to create confusion. Manny, won't you come over here on this other side? I want you to lead. Now, we're not splitting the church. You guys do this. You can join either side. But you're going to lead the Levites. You're the guy that's going to say, Arise, O God, and let your enemies be scattered. You're going to be the guy that says, For the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. So if you're, if you're capable of exercising this spiritual authority and you're feeling led to do it, I want you to start helping my dad pray right now all over the sanctuary. God, I come against that spirit of hell in the name of Jesus. I bind a spirit over our children, our grandchildren, just like Pastor Jerry anointing his granddaughter today. I need that revelation. Bible in my own family, God. Now, the rest of you, I want you to join the praise team right now. Lift your hands, Manny, all over this crowd. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Let it be like a thunder all over this congregation as we join in this prayer and we lift our voices right now. Heavenly Father, I bind every power of hell that's tried to destroy our lives. 
And I ask you, God, to release your authority, release your anointing, release your grace, oh God. Loosen this nation from the grip of Leviathan. Break the bondage of Jezebel over our culture, Heavenly Father. Release us from the bondage of perversion. Oh God, I praise you. I magnify you. I exalt you in this house. For you are great, oh God, and greatly to be praised. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Now, somebody help me out right now. I want you to clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Come on, the walls are coming down right now. Clap your hands, shout unto God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. I want to do three things. I want to lead you in a sinner's prayer. I want to bless your life. When I dismiss the service, we're going to open the altars. If you need special prayer or it's just your time to come down to share a moment in the altars, I want you to give my family an opportunity. Lay your hands on you. If you're visiting with us, this altar call is very polite. We don't overstep. We don't understep. We just lay our hands on you. We're not trying to verbally lead you at that moment. We're just going to join you and pray with you. And I believe you need that moment. Before we get to that, let me say to those of you watching me online or by television or perhaps even in the house, you don't have to go to hell. You don't have to live in hell. For we have found blood that pardons and we have found stripes that heal. And I know a God that will save your life. I want to teach you a prayer today, and I believe if you'll pray this prayer in faith believing, God can save your life. Would everyone repeat this with me, Jesus? Forgive me of my sins. I'm so sorry. I'm coming home. I know you came. I know you lived and died for me. And I know you rose from the dead. And I know you're coming back. I don't want to be left out. So please, come into my heart. Save my soul. Write my name down in your book. And help me be a Christian. In Jesus' name. Praise God. If you prayed that prayer today and you're watching me by television or online, please contact us by the information that you see on your screen or type into the chat stream. I prayed that prayer. We want to help you. If you're here in the sanctuary today, you say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer and today my life has been changed. Would you quietly lift your hand as a testimony? God bless you. Praise God. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Would you give God a hand clap of praise? <laughs> praise the Lord. May you be blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Blessed when you rise and when you lay down at night. May the Lord bless you and keep you and turn his countenance towards you and be gracious to you. Make his face shine on you and give you peace. Beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. A garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm on your face and the rains fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. God bless you. I love you. I'll see you next Sunday.